right. The next case to be presented is that of AHS. She's a 41 year old woman presented to the emergency room with hemophilia. Uh, this woman recently underwent coiling of a congenital arterial venous malformation. Uh, she, her post op uh, course was complicated by urinary retention, and she was discharged on post op day four with a Foley catheter in place. Uh, shortly after she went home, she started experiencing gross hematuria and presented back to the emergency room with 10 hours of gross hematuria and her catheter had been clogged for six hours. She had a great deal of pelvic pain, uh, spasm that wasn't very well controlled by oxybutynin and uh, BNO suppository. Her lower abdomen was quite full and she had, as I said, gross hematuria. Her past medical history, aside from the AVM, she had chronic diarrhea, which workup of that led to the discovery of the AVM. Hypertension, GERD. Her past surgeries include cesarean section and hernia repair. Her family history was non-contributory. She is a married woman, uh, and she's not a smoker. Her medications are appropriate for, anti, for hypertension, uh, GERD, and she's on an oral contraceptive. She's allergic to codeine, erythromycin, naproxen, and tegaderm silver mash. Um, on exam, she did have a very full low abdomen uh, with a palpable bladder. She had new ecchymosis spreading over right greater than left her lower abdomen. And uh, she did have a 14 French Foley catheter in place, which was not draining. And the urine in the reservoir was deep bred with a uh, great deal of clot. Her creatinine was normal. Her hematocrit on presentation was 32, and she did, was not coagulopathic with an INR of 1.2. Just to show you what was coiled prior to uh, her presentation, it's a pretty significant AVM, which they reconstructed in 3D here. And they had to do a, a great deal of coiling to get this thing to stop. <laughs> They basically filled the entire part. That's a typical case, right? Yeah. They basically had to fill that large saccular part. So this is off of the right iliac, left iliac? All right. So where is this aneurysm off? It's off the right. Internal or the external one there? I don't know. There you have a lot of coils in there. <laughs> exactly. So at this point... Uh, we exchanged her catheter for a large bore catheter, manual irrigated out a lot of clot, continued to irrigate out a lot of clot with a lot of grossly blooded urine, and a recheck of her CBC showed that her uh, hematocrit had dropped from 32 on presentation to 28, to 26, to 25, and so this 41-year-old woman with gross hematuria and rapidly decreasing hematocrit after coiling, it's uh, pretty obvious. You showed cases yesterday, uh, <laughs> <laughs> So far stable hemodynamically, right, so she's bleeding. Um, where is she bleeding from? It's probably related to the aneurysm. Uh, as you eroded something with all these uh, coils, um, uh, unlike our stent guy, who pretty obvious a stent erosion into, with radiated tissue. Here we're dealing with someone who's basically healthy, and you dropped a ton of coils, and that's why I was trying to ask if it's down in the internal uh, or have a gastric artery. Um, could uh, any of those coils uh, either eroded or otherwise affected the bleeding? Uh, it's coming somewhere from the, uh, the ureter. Could they have injured the uh, ureter and putting all those coils in there? Probably not. But I'm still talking to my IR guys saying, folks, you put this in here and there's blood. Uh, can you help me sort out? So um, you, if you just look at the bladder or take it to the OR and wash out clots, I'm afraid you're still going to get a red out um, you know, when you see a red. Uh, but um, stable and potentially uh, more of a scope for more. When you, when you, did you feel you got all the clot out? Um, we did feel we got all the clot out, but it was clear but that there was still bleeding. Did you have a handy that you could stick in? We did. I'll do it. <laughs> um, right, so you've got to go ahead. The OR uh, uh, performs the stuff. You want to already get the clot out, yeah, because that's very really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Also, time many vessel found on right edge. Exactly. Of the we were able to fulgurate that, and the bleeding stopped. Okay. Uh, we also noted that the whole right side of her bladder wall was uh, pretty inflamed and there was venous engorgement of the right bladder wall. So just a, a still shot of, of the yeah. culprit there. She did well postoperatively. Uh, 
was discharged home on post-op day one. However, when she returned uh, after one month, she was still having a great deal of right flank pain. <coughs> was taking Percocet every six hours. Got a renal ultrasound. She had some persistent right hydronephrosis. And, um, down to where? To, it was down to about the level of the mid ureter. So not your iliac vessels? No. Um, and we placed a right double J stent, hoping to decompress the, the system and treat the pain. Exactly. Any trouble getting that up? Not really. Okay. Uh, at, the, at that time, we also wanted to make look functionally, given the persistent right hydro, whether, whether there was any functional impingement. There was a really minor delay of uh, this excretion on the right. The stent up, I Sorry? This was before. Before, yes. Yeah. So we're looking for our. Got a dilated ureter all the way down to the bladder, it looks like? Or am I overreading this? I think you're overreading it. Okay. Uh, and based on imaging we got later. All right, and there was no evidence of the UPJ obstruction? No. Okay. So um, she presented a month after that. Her right flank pain was gone, but she had, she a, stent had a stent in and she did not tolerate it well at all. She had pretty bad ir irritative voiding system or symptoms, sorry. Okay. Uh, and we had discussed with her um, the possibility that her ur the hydronephrosis might come from her ureter being impinged by that large extensive coiling. Yeah. Um, and she really, the right flank pain was not tolerable to her, that's why we did the stent, and she did not tolerate the stent well. So the options are you know, decompress her from above, nobody likes that. Or and you know, not it, tolerating was pain or irritative voiding symptoms. Irritative voiding symptoms. Okay. Um, right, so so we good. we got a CT scan basically for uh, planning. We did uh, think about basically moving the ureter away from a, a decompression. So in order to see what we were looking at, you can see we've got uh, proximal mild to moderate hydronephrosis and hydroureter. Once you get down to the, <clears throat> mid ureter level, it's decompressed. And once you get down to the level of the coil, yes, you see that the, the ureter, and I'll point out, the ureter is actually right about here. It's in close proximity to the coil. You could have predicted that. <laughs> and so, uh, two months postoperatively, she's got persistent bladder pain and urgency after her stent. CT and imaging, when you look at the entire series, uh, went over it with the radiologist because, you know, with the scatter artifact, it's very difficult to tell where you're, what you're looking at. Um, impingement of the coil at the, at the distal right ureter as well as persistent hydronephrosis. That was not adding up. Because um, you can easily slide a coil up and easily get a stent up, right? So, and, um, and your, your, um, um, your nuclear medicine studies show how much? Very moderate uh, delay, like a minute, and eventual full excretion. 60 40 split of function. And if you took the stent out, she just has chronic flank pain? I don't know that we did a trial of that. She was not willing. Because what you're arguing is uh, that she's obstructed. Usually, obstructive pain or with acute obstruction will get colic. With chronic obstruction, the colic eventually goes away. It's because, I mean, yes, you potentially damage the kidney and you get a result of thinning uh, a parenchyma, just like a UPJ obstruction of the stricture, but usually the, the body adjusts to the pain and it goes away. So I mean, she's a, we're not dealing with a narcotic abuser or any other. No, person. but she was a very anxious person who anxious. Had, had trouble tolerating discomfort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is one of those, I'm not, uh, I, 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 it's the smell you're taking me into a ureter reimplant, um, and I'm not sure I would have walked down that pathway um, because I, it's, yeah, you got the hydro ureter, but okay. Uh, in terms of, is there really an obstruction? You got an eight French stent up there without trouble, at least a six French. A six. Yeah. Um, I might even consider ureteroscoping it just to confirm that I have patency. Mm -hmm. Right, so smell you're taking me to a reimplant, and um, so the concern is right now she's got mild impingement, she's not tolerating the stent. 
Yeah, and if we go step, without it, it isn't this get worse? Step, to me, it's easy to take the step down. And, and the flank pain was, she said, worse than the stent pain. For the first, that was before you. Before the we put the stent in. I understand, but now it's later. Right. So you take the stent out, and yes, she's going to be calling for the first two or three weeks, but no one ever died of pain. Um, so uh, you know, you just be a little patient here and see where uh, 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 You might die of pain, but uh, anyway, I'm just saying because we're contemplating now major reconstruction in a in a pelvis that's got a lot of reaction uh, to coils. Um, and uh, where you're, as I said, uh, what I suspect you're taking me to is you're reimplanting this ureter of the bladder, and ultimately you're here to relieve pain, and uh, that's always one of the more, without an obvious point of obstruction, um, I've learned that uh, the pain doesn't always go away. And so I, I, you have yet to convince me that you've got an obstructive ureter here other than the mild hybrid ureter. And, uh, I didn't see it. I didn't see a delay on the CT scan. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Um, when you got the CT, right. when, when you get that CT scan, this is one of the things right. I will go back and review and see how rapid how? Did, did your nephrograms appear simultaneously. If they did, you really don't have functional obstruction. I know in the nuclear medicine, look at your basic CT. If if you really have basic. obstruction. One, one kidney will light up first in the very early phase, and the other one will not. If they both light up simultaneously, I don't think you have significant functional obstruction because your dye is being processed by the kidney evenly. In a, in a truly obstructed kidney, you're going to see a delay. Those, those of us who grew up in the IVP era know that because we used to look for the delayed uh, function on kidney, but you see it on the SCAT scan too. So mm -hmm. the residents who haven't thought of that, one of the things I look for in functional obstruction is in the early phase of the CT was there, did they both like light up at the same time? Like you, you, you can't. You um, know, we you had know. late phase on, on the CT. Yeah, I would have probably taken the stent out, seen what the pain would have done, and maybe ordered one more CT telling the radiologist, focus on the early phase and tell me if this differential light up. If, you, if I truly had differential function, I'd be more comfortable doing what I'm, you're about to show me what you did. Which we did. <laughs> we did what I a robotic did. assisted laparoscopic ureonium cystostomy. Okay. Um, to make sure that the tension was, um, or the anastomosis was not under any tension, we did perform a psoas hitch and a right you, double. You didn't stick a needle through the coils or anything, did you? Pretty. Straightforward. Uh, well, I wouldn't say straightforward. They, they, we spent a lot of time yeah, dissecting to get yeah, a clear feel. Okay. Um, Postoperatively, um, she did go home with a, a stent and a Foley for decompression. Uh, she came back on day seven, no leak on the cystogram, and Foley was removed. Yep. Her, she was very happy to have her ureteral stent removed yeah. after the procedure, and she's been doing very well. The pain is gone. I made the right call, uh, but. Uh, I guess the level of evidence to do a major reconstruction for like that, I, I need a little more convincing. And those are the things I would have done. I might have gotten to the same point you did, uh, but I would have demanded a little more to convince me that I'm truly dealing with an obstructive ureter at the level. When you did the dissection, did you did the ureter stop at the coils or coming over the iliac vessels, or did you get more length? Um, it, it didn't stop at the coils. I mean, when I say stop, I mean you didn't hit a concrete block where it no. was a trap. So you could dissect the ureter out easily, mm -hmm. so you have plenty of length. So doing, uh, doing the reimplant was not a problem at all. No. So you did the psoas hitch rather than just plugging in the bottom to do what? Essentially making sure that we had slack. We had plenty of slack. Okay. Well, did, what's the pathology on the on the the yes from second? Would he have ischemic ureter? Uh, uh, that was not sent for pathology. I mean, you sent you sent it with normal ureter that you're plugging in, yeah. so you. But again, not having a difficult, you have trouble with 